Now, here is a statistic that's going to impress you no matter what. New reports today. Now, get ready. 25% of all job growth in this country in the 2000s has taken place just since President Trump has been in office, less than 20 months. The Trump economy has also uh, brought 2.8 million Americans off the food stamp rolls, not to mention record unemployment lows in the black and Hispanic communities as well, an extraordinary, unprecedented record uh, in the first 20 months in office. And on Wall Street, stocks again closing higher. The Dow up 40 points, the S&P up 10, the Nasdaq up 48, volume on the big board, light trading, 2.6 billion shares you'd think we were in August or something. And the Department of Justice appealing the $85 billion decision on the ATT uh, Time Warner deal. The Department of Justice says the judge's approval of that merger lacked what they call, quote, fundamental principles of economics and common sense, two important uh, issues to have right. PepsiCo CEO Indra no Noye uh, stepping down, effective October 3rd. She will serve as the chairwoman of the board of directors until early 2019. And a reminder to listen to my reports three times a day, coast to coast on the Salem Radio Network. Well, that is it for us tonight. Quite a, quite a day. We thank you for being with us. And tomorrow, please join us when we have Judge Janine Pirro, The Wall Street Journal's James Freeman, the Council on Foreign Relations, Paul Bracken, Professor Bracken of Yale, and RNC committee woman, Army Dillon, join us. We hope you will, too. Good night from New York. Good evening, everybody. Our top stories tonight, the Trump administration cracking down on Iran, reinstating sanctions after pulling out of the disastrous Obama nuclear deal. National Security Advisor John Bolton joins us tonight. He's here to talk about the Trump administration's tough new stance against the Islamist regime. Robert Mueller putting his star, so-called witness, on the stand on day five of the Paul Manafort trial. But significant questions of credibility loom over the entire testimony of the former Manafort associate, Rick Gates. Also tonight, while the national left-wing media whines about perceived threats, the radical left goes on a violent spree, attacking conservative voices and even our military. And the booming Trump economy, not even the Dems and rhinos can talk down. A quarter of all new American jobs this century were created under this president. That's right, President Trump. And he hasn't been in office 20 months. Our top story tonight, the Trump administration today announced the reimposition of sanctions against Iran. Those began at midnight. The president following through on his promise to undo the Obama-era nuclear deal with Tehran. The first set of sanctions returning tonight target the Iranian automotive sector as well as gold and other metals. A second set of sanctions targeting oil in the Iranian Central Bank will be reimposed in November. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani responded, saying Iran couldn't hold talks with the United States while under those sanctions, but also acknowledging that they would be willing to talk if the Trump administration is sincere. Joining me now, U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton. Ambassador, good to have you with us. Glad to be with you, Lou. Ambassador, let's start with Iran. Uh, you have made it clear, the president has made it clear, uh, that this is uh, going to be stern stuff, your policy toward uh, the, uh, against Iran. Uh, these, first, uh, these first sanctions, however are not as powerful, one could argue, as the second set, which would come with the November 4th. Uh, your judgment. Well, the uh, purpose of the phased uh, impact of the sanctions is to provide a fair wind-down period for companies that relied on the uh, deal made in 2015. But I think the effect of the sanctions has already been felt in Iran. The currency since the president announced uh, our withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal, the Iranian currency uh, has decreased by nearly half. Uh, we have seen millions and millions of, uh, of dollars in uh, currency leaving 
uh, Iran is the elites move their assets out of the right. country for fear of this. Uh, and we've seen a continuation of demonstrations and even riots in towns and cities across Iran as the economy has gone into a tailspin. So I think the effects are already being felt. The president's tough policy on Iran, withdrawing from the deal, now uh, these uh, reinstitutions of sanctions. Uh, we get a report from uh, Tehran. Rouhani saying that Iran is open to negotiations if the United States is sincere, referring to, I assume, uh, the president talking about a comprehensive deal is still uh, something that he would be interested in negotiating. Uh, could, you, could you explain that for us? Sure. Look, the president has said uh, since really beginning in the 2016 campaign, that he's open to negotiating with leaders like Rouhani, like with Kim Jong-un, uh, to sit down with them. The, the Iranians have used negotiations in the path just to delay uh, the, the effect of uh, sanctions and, and pressure and to continue making progress on their nuclear weapons program. So if the Iranians really want to sit down and talk about not just the failed nuclear deal, but their ballistic missile program and their support for terrorism and their belligerent military activity in the region, we're prepared to do that. That's a suggestion that France's president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, has made that we, we'd like to see the Iranians carry through on. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting, and I'm trying to get a sense of what weight you give Rouhani's statement. Uh, it, it's obviously too early to call it a breakthrough. Uh, how would you characterize it? Well, in the past, these kinds of statements have been propaganda. We'd like to mm -hmm. see some real performance from Iran. But the president made it clear he'd be willing to speak uh, as long as we cover mm -hmm. all these issues, not just the failed nuclear deal. And turning to China, uh, the tariffs, uh, the, the, there is uh, obviously uh, this is starting to spiral upwards. Uh, it is still a, a minute fraction of the total trade relationship, which a lot of commentators forget when they start trying to explain why a market moves uh, monolithically, at least in the minds of some. Uh, your judgment about how far this is going to go and how far uh, President Trump is prepared to go? Well, I wouldn't e underestimate how determined President Trump right. is. I think the ball's really in China's court. Look, for 20 years now, almost, as part of the world trade organization, they have pursued a mercantilist policy in what should be a free trade environment. And they've done worse than that. They've stolen American and European technology. They've engaged in forced technology transfers. They've uh, been biased against uh, foreign investors and traders in China. Uh, and for too many years, American administrations have let the Chinese get away with it. So I think the, pre the purpose of the president's tariffs is not just related to the trade deficit, but to force China to be held accountable uh, for the violations of the agreements it's made and the commitments it's made about how to deal internationally. And it's extraordinary, the years and years of what has been basically propaganda from so-called free traders about the fact that free trade does not have costs uh, associated with <laughs> with the US economy it's been deleterious it has cut down economic growth the president in less than two years has already broken through it seems uh, to the public consciousness about what the reality is that we have been on the losing end of a trade war that's been waged against this country at least at least since 2001 uh, and China's admission to the World Trade Organization Right. And the president said in the context of the European Union, uh, look, if you want to talk free trade, let's have no tariffs. Let's have no non-tariff barriers. Let's have no subsidies. If you really want to do it, to have a free trade zone like we have internally in the United States, we're prepared to take a look at that. But in the case of China in particular, I think even the Europeans agree they've taken advantage of a, frame, a framework of free trade for their own policies. And they've succeeded. Uh, and it is, as the president made that offer, you could almost hear uh, uh, the, uh, the Chinese and the Europeans uh, sucking wind through their teeth at the very prospect that suddenly they would have to go to free trade. Ambassador, always good to see you. Thanks for joining us here. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Lou. Ambassador John Bolton, National Security Advisor to the president. Up next, explosive new details emerging about the Chinese spy who worked with Senate Democrat Dianne Feinstein for nearly two decades. I said two decades, almost. We'll have the latest for you. The Daily Caller's Luke Rosiak joins us with breaking news. Stay with us. We'll be right back. President Trump took aim at Senator Dianne Feinstein at an Ohio rally over the weekend. The Democrat rocked by recent revelations her office had been 
infiltrated by a Chinese spy who worked for her for nearly 20 years. And speaking of China, it's just come out that the Democratic leader and the leader of the Russian investigation, Dianne Feinstein, had a Chinese spy as her driver for 20 years. And she's leading the Russian investigation, if that's what you call it. How about leading? No, no, she's leading the Russian witch hunt. A Democrat-inspired witch hunt. And we have breaking news for you tonight. The Daily Caller is now reporting the identity of Feinstein's so-called Chinese driver. It turns out he's, well, he was quite a bit more than a driver. Joining us tonight, Daily Caller's investigative reporter, Luke Rosiak. Luke, great to have you with us. And this is uh, remarkable. The identity first uh, of, the, of the spy who worked, quote unquote, as Feinstein put it, as a driver for 20 years. This is a guy named Russell Lowe, L-E-W-E. He's a Chinese-American who was her office manager for 20 years, so he's not a low-level guy. That's Did pretty, you say uh, office manager? He was office manager in San Francisco. So he was higher up. He was meeting with ambassadors. He was, you know, attending high-profile events. He was not a gopher. He was not a, uh, just a mere driver, as Feinstein characterized him. Well, perhaps she mischaracterized or misremembered. Uh, that's quite a different uh, matter. And as office manager, he would have access to all sorts of information, as well as the comings and goings of uh, Diane Feinstein, who served as a chair of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence for years and years. Yeah, and as a driver, because that was part of his capacity, presumably, mm -hmm. he was in a position to overhear pretty much more than anything. Right. And uh, as you heard in Donald Trump's kind of clip, she basically shrugged about this when it came out. When, she, when the FBI told her that this guy was working with the Chinese government, she didn't tell anyone. She didn't even tell her own staff. She just let him retire. So when you look at that tweet, she says, oh, well, the Chinese were approaching my guy, but I made sure he didn't work here anymore. They weren't approaching him. They were working with him. And she let him, she's very, she phrases that carefully because she didn't even fire this guy. This guy retired with a pension. He is now working at what appears to me to be a propaganda outfit in, in uh, San Francisco pushing dirt on Japan. So this isn't a guy that was merely recruited by China. He's a sort of a player in these geopolitical warfare battles, uh, mm -hmm. sort of a, this militant Chinese guy who's professionally uh, involved in this kind of thing. And he's out there actually continuing to make speeches uh, where he is billed as a former aid to Dianne Feinstein. And that's what happens when you cover up things like that. The, the people get to go ride your coattails and continue to associate with you. He's not disgraced. Uh, he's still out there actually meeting. He met with a congressman, uh, Mike Honda, recently. He's still associating with these uh, Washington types. He's still part of the political scene because Dianne Feinstein did not take swift action. And, and his name again? Russell Lowe, L-O-W-E. It's, uh, it's amazing. Chinese-American, uh, still in San Francisco. Uh, and, and without, uh, you know, belaboring the point, where in the world are, are intelligence agencies? Uh, they are the ones who inform Feinstein of his, uh, that he had handlers, uh, not just simply uh, you know, people with whom he had little conversations, uh, had handlers uh, from the Chinese government uh, driving his efforts. Right. And when you witness a cover up like this, who knows what you can believe? But the limited information that we've heard is that they said, OK, he stole political information, but not national intelligence. <laughs> so we're not going to prosecute him, which, by the way, of course, you can prosecute. The FBI finds ways of prosecuting people when they want to. For one thing, you could presumably charge him with the Foreign Agent Registration yeah. Act, just like Manafort. Um, but it, what the sense that I get is that Feinstein told them, hey, there's no need to prosecute this. Let's just make it make it go go away quietly. And the FBI was happy to happy to do Bidding. Well, it's it's almost uh, presages the, uh, the the Comey struggles between gross negligence for uh, in the investigation of Hillary Clinton uh, and uh, landing on instead of gross negligence, extreme carelessness, uh, which did not mandate prosecution. He said it turns out that that's uh, a false, uh, uh, if you will, choice uh, and not true at all. Uh, look, let's go to the to Feinstein's tweet responding to the president, calling her calling her out. This is Feinstein's uh, response uh, to the to the Trump tweets. The FBI told me she acknowledges 
told me five years ago it had concerns that China was seeking to recruit an administrative member of my California staff despite no access to sensitive information. I took those concerns seriously, learned the facts, and made sure the employee left my office immediately. Well, now that sounds absolutely casual and harmless. Uh, no threats, uh, no secret, uh, you know, access to secret information. Uh, but again, it wasn't a driver either. It was her office manager. Well, keep in mind the way that, you know, she didn't express any outrage here. She's all, the right. cognitive dissonance is enough to make your head explode. I thought we cared about meddling. I thought we cared about national security and classified information. And when it happens to the Democrats, as it has time and time again, uh, they kind of just are, take such a casual attitude. Remember, Feinstein was the one who, when the intelligence community inspector general, Charles McCullough, who was an Obama appointee, he was kind of the one who actually found classified information on Hillary's secret email server. And he said that he was bullied by Dianne Feinstein until he dropped it, which right. is a pretty huge deal. And another huge deal. She's not unacquainted with huge deals. Remember, it was Senator Feinstein as chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee when it was discovered that John Brennan, CIA, had been surveilling the committee's servers. Uh, first, he denied it. So they not only spied on the Senate Intelligence Committee, which has oversight responsibility in addition to everything else, if that wasn't uh, bad enough, they, also, they were in charge of oversight. Uh, she didn't, first of all, he denied doing so, then had to admit he did, and then she said, well, we're not going to prosecute anybody despite his actions as the head of the CIA uh, in that an agency surveilling. I, I mean, Feinstein he has a record here one wonders why anyone listened to her when they started talking about a special counsel for crying out loud. Right, and this is kind of what the Congress does. They w they would rather be compromised than embarrassed. And she just said, look yeah. how embarrassing this is. The Chinese must be laughing at us. And I think ah. they are. I think the Chinese are laughing all the way to the bank when this guy is still out there in, in public life with no consequences. Well, maybe and this explains something else, Luke, that's worth pursuing, and that is... Maybe the Chinese had so much on her that she was incapable of giving up her access uh, or in any way thwarting uh, the many sources uh, at the CIA that she had access to and who were sharing intelligence with her and her committee. Uh, this looks very dangerous and potentially uh, extraordinarily explosive. Yes, and look at how the FBI handled it. They merely told her what they had learned and allowed her to handle that. Contrast that to what they did with Donald Trump when they basically infiltrated the campaign instead of just going to him and saying, look, there may be problems with your staffers. We wanted to make you aware. Yeah, yeah or contrast it with, for example, a meeting between Donald Trump Jr. Uh, and a Russian attorney in the Trump Tower and the interest that it just uh, is extensive across Capitol Hill, particularly Adam Schiff, talking about his deep concerns, yet you have absolute knowledge uh, of uh, all of the contacts and correlations between uh, whether it's uh, Senator Mark Warner, the vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and, and uh, overseas spies and uh, interlocutors. And, you know, there just seems to be a, an absolute imbalance here between what the FBI gets an interested in and what the intelligence committees get interested in uh, and the reality, which is that we are watching uh, right now a, a, a country whose president is being gamed by a special counsel and the Democratic Party severely and to the detriment of this nation. And here you have a Chinese spy infiltrating the chairman yeah. of the Intelligence Committee, and the media didn't even care enough to look up his name. Uh, the story's been out for about five days. There was no stakeouts. There was no, uh, you know, uh, staking out people's houses, massive press conferences. Uh, no one could be bothered to look up this guy's name in public records until my, my colleague Peter Hassan at the Daily Caller News Foundation did it. Well, uh, congratulations to the Daily Caller and uh, our compliments to him uh, and to you uh, for bringing us this story tonight. Uh, oh, yes, there was another spy case that just came to mind, just, just coincidentally. There were the spies within the Trump campaign who had been placed there by the democratically and the deep state-inspired uh, FBI leadership as well. Oh, did I mention the FISA court judges? It looks like they have a problem as well. Luke, thanks for being with us. We appreciate it always. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Luke Rosiak.
Mark Zuckerberg now wants to use our personal banking information to offer new features and to boost user engagement. Why not? Facebook has such a record. Facebook asking big banks for their users' personal banking information that would include uh, card transactions along with account balances. Facebook claiming it will never, ever, ever share that information with third parties. But that hasn't gone so well, has it, in the past? We understand one major bank has withdrawn from the generous offer on the part of Facebook. Uh, that bank not named uh, at this point. Well, 11 people killed following a deadly weekend in Chicago. Authorities say 70 people were shot. Gang violence, uh, the, the reason in most instances, the leftist mayor, Rahm Emanuel, and the city's police superintendent are now calling on citizens in the community to, quote, step up to help combat the violence. So far, the murder rate is down 20 percent this year in Chicago. Last year, there were 650 homicides in the cities. That's what passes for a baseline in the city of Chicago when it comes to murder rates. Well, will the Obama administration's failure to address the scourge uh, of shootings and murder in the Windy City be on display in the presidential library that's set to cost taxpayers uh, hundreds of millions of dollars? Be sure to vote in tonight's poll. The question is, do you think the national left-wing media will ever cover real-life violence against communities and conservatives as vigorously as they pursue perceived threats against themselves, that is, so-called journalists? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. We'd like to hear from you. Up next, former Clinton White House Press Secretary Joe Lockhart is very upset, challenging President Trump. And guess what he's going after? Imagine this, the spokesman for the Clinton White House. He wants to talk about credibility. We'll have his outrageous comments here and much more next. Ed Rollins, Michael Goodwin, join us. Stay with us. We'll be right back. President Trump in Ohio over the weekend to support Republican congressional candidate Troy Balderson. And while he was at it, he gave a shout out to Fox, including me. They're blowing them away in the ratings. Oh, excuse me. I almost forgot I would have been in big trouble. The great Lou Dobbs. Right? We're going to freeze that and we're going to just run that as a loop for a while here, if you don't mind. But, but anyway, thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate it. Joe Lockhart, former White House press secretary under Bill Clinton, is now using the national spotlight to target President Trump and question Mr. Trump's credibility. This is a guy who worked for Bill Clinton. Listen to what Lockhart said on the fake news network known as CNN. This has never happened before. We've had, um, you know, we've had great presidents. We've had terrible presidents, um, Republicans and Democrats. But we've never had anything like this where a president, we have a president who is incapable of telling the truth. Whew. That's sort of an ironic uh, position for Lockhart to take, uh, coming from the Clinton administration. Lockhart apparently forgot about his old boss. President Clinton lied about uh, and later admitted to, well, affairs uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, you remember the details. Don't need to uh, burden, uh, burden anyone with that. Joining us tonight, Ed Rollins, mm -hmm. former Reagan White House political director, Great America PAC chairman, Fox business political analyst, and savant. And Michael Goodwin, savant in his own right, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, Fox Business contributor. Good to have you both here. Thank you. There, there's more than just a little irony here, Michael. Uh, Lockhart suddenly comes out of uh, obscurity to, right. uh, <laughs> to yeah. talk about credibility. I yeah. mean, that's, that's, a, that's laughable beyond belief. Yeah, look, I'm, especially given the seriousness of, of events that happened while he was part of the Clinton right. White House and part of the... the uh, the press secretary's office, he also went off on the press secretaries, both Sean Spicer and Sarah Huckabee Sanders, basically accused them of lying all the time, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this is rich. This is indeed rich coming from the Clinton campaign, the Clinton team itself. I mean, the Clintons themselves. And you say, what is it about the Clintons that's distinctive? You would say, well, they don't tell the truth. I mean, that is history's verdict on both Clintons. Yeah. Don't forget his role the last several years as the defender of the National Football League. 
<laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. I didn't even want to get into that. <laughs> Did you know that the Hall of Fame game was down 13% in viewership? You know, I'm a football, rabid football fan, and I didn't even know there was a game until the next day. So that's, that's so obviously, obviously Lockhart didn't do a very good job of whoever his success well, was in publicity. I, I, I don't know how good a job you can do with these I, I mean, the the players seem to have more intelligence than the owners or the NFL uh, front office. I mean, uh, all they have to do, you know, by the way, uh, Dak uh, Prescott, the quarterback of, of the uh, Dallas Cowboys, I've, I've got to give him a shout out. The man, as I tweeted, uh, speaking plainly, straightforwardly, saying this is not the place, this is not the way in which to... Uh, uh, to express political views during the national anthem. It's disrespectful. I, I love the fact that one of the players at least had the guts and, the, and was strong and straightforward enough to just say that. Yeah, look, I, he's a great antidote to Colin Kaepernick, right? I mean, who started all this nonsense has become something of an icon on the left. I think it's, I think it's disgraceful. Well, don't, let's not forget Terrell Owens, who was inducted and refused to go to the ceremony, decided to give his, uh, his, his speech a thousand miles away at his alma mater as opposed to going to the Hall of Fame. I think if I would have, uh, if I would have been the commissioner of football, I'd have said, thank you very much. You can wait till next year you can come or whenever, whenever it's convenient for you, it'll be convenient for us. You know, every organization has some damn fools at it. The NFL, obviously, no, right. uh, no exception. Let, let's turn to this, uh, the president in Ohio over the weekend, making it very clear who he is for. Uh, it's, uh, this has been the 12th district, I believe it is, uh, has been a safe district for decades, and suddenly there is a, a heated battle uh, between uh, Troy Balderson and his Democratic opponent, uh, Danny, Danny uh, Connor, or O'Connor. Uh, Danny Boy is Danny the president. Boy, doesn't, doesn't matter what. The- <laughs> <laughs> uh, this the president putting his himself on the line. He is there for his guy, uh, and he made it clear that uh, this is who he wants. In well, maybe it may be offset a little bit by the fact that Governor Kasich is also endorsing. This is his original seat many years ago. Was uh, he's endorsing what? Same candidate. So. So if, 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 if for some reason... You really are a troublemaker. No, if, some, if for some reason it loses, it's not Trump's fault, it's Kasich's fault. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of that? I tell so you, let's try and you win know, Ed keeps his hand in this political stuff every once in a while. Let's, try and, win. let's try and win it. Well, Balderson could then make the, the claim, if I can bring Trump and Kasich together, I can, I can really do things for Ohio. Oh, that's, so, that's, <laughs> well, I, I don't think they're together exactly. I mean, it's, I'm it's listening dead, to Kasich on Sunday respect. television oh, uh, talking about, uh, you know, the suburban housewife uh, as if he's discovered a demographic that is particularly explosive and important right. and potent. Uh, I mean, Kasich has become the most, yeah. ir- I think, arguably the most, no, that's too strong, one of the most irritating personalities in all of politics. As, and, he's, and he's only a governor. Yeah. As, my, as, as Michael was asking me, why is he so unpopular? And I said, I've known John forever. Uh, when he first got elected in 82, I said, John, it's known in Ohio that John can walk into a room with his friends and go with a room full of enemies. Uh, <laughs> I believe it. No, I just, believe just, it. Just, uh, There's just something so abrasive about the man. Right. Uh, except in this case where he is supporting the president's choice. Uh, to uh, fill the seat in the 12th district. Well, we want the Republican. We need the Republican. Uh, absolutely. What do you think? Now I want you to, you guys to give us, this is where you earn your money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, this is yeah, it. This is it. You ready? Yeah, yeah. Who is going to win in Let the 12th go district? First. I think no, I'm, no, I'm, no, no, no. You, you can't derail me with your no, I, I, diversionary I, tactics. I, I'm too slick for that. I do think uh, Trump's visit will will make the difference. I do too. I think Troy, I think Troy will be elected tomorrow then has to run again in th- four months to get for the second part of this, uh, this is to finish out five, four months of a, of a term. So they're going to get to do this again. Get to do it again. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, this is important, and the president uh, uh, wants Balderson, and I think the people of Ohio and the 12th district certainly have heard him on this. Uh, and uh, we do agree. Yes. That's yes. A, that the president's appearance in Ohio yeah. <clears throat> makes all the difference. I mean, he's got a heck of a record going. I think he's undefeated. Oh no, there's one there's defeat. One defeat. Uh, but we won't even mention that. Yeah, look, I, and I think uh, this is this is this is core. Forty Trump some country. odd wins. Yeah, yeah, this, but this is core Trump country. You have to be able to hold Ohio, both in the midterms and in the uh, presidential. Yeah, well, I don't see. You know, I, it's interesting. People are saying things like he's going to have to hold. You know, the Democrats are going to have to do something. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're the ones who have yet to come up with a program and answer or have anything to say about the record that this president has created 
in 20 months. Well, the secret is to make sure the country knows what their record is and what they want to do with the country when they yeah. favor that back again. So. Well, I think they can look back to eight years of wonder under uh, President Obama and re Good. recall yeah. it rather vividly. Ed Rollins. Thank you. Michael Goodwin. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. Sure hope you're right. <laughs> Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro surviving an assassination attempt over the weekend, delivering a speech to hundreds of soldiers in Caracas, thousands even. Bodyguards rushing to shield Maduro. Watch this. There's the display. Uh, and that's what happens when a few, a few bomb-laden drones overfly the president of uh, Venezuela. There. Now, I have never seen that before. Has anybody else nope. ever seen yeah. that? I have never maneuver. seen that. Nope. Uh, you wouldn't want a short bodyguard in that situation, <laughs> would you? Maduro, uh, protected by his troops as uh, his other troops flood the square. Uh, tensions have been rising in uh, Venezuela. Inflation on track to reach a million percent by the end of the year. People are fighting outright starvation in Venezuela. Some eating dogs, their dogs, their neighbors' dogs, stray dogs, whatever it takes. That's how desperate things are, we're told, in Venezuela. Coming up next, President Trump making an endorsement today for a longtime loyal supporter in the Kansas race for governor, Chris Kobach. He joins us here next. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Another election tomorrow. President Trump backing Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach for the Republican nomination to be governor of Kansas in tomorrow's primary. President Trump tweeted this, quote, Chris Kobach, a strong and early supporter of mine, is running for governor of the great state of Kansas. He is a fantastic guy who loves his state and our country. He will be a great governor and has my full and total endorsement, strong on crime, border and military. Vote Tuesday. Chris Kobach is the man the president was talking about. He joins us tonight, the Kansas Secretary of State, running for the Republican nomination. And the election suddenly is upon us. Uh, Chris, good to have you with us. And uh, you're running basically neck and neck with your opponent. Uh, you know, some of the polls have you up. Uh, give us uh, a sense of where you are right now in the race uh, and, and, and evaluate for us the support, the endorsement of President Trump in Kansas. Oh, great to be back with you, Lou. Uh, yeah, the polls had a yeah, single-digit race. Our latest poll, had and this was about <clears throat> five days ago, had us up about nine points. But, you know, 20% were undecided in that poll, and, and the president's endorsement comes at a pivotal time because it helps Republicans decide if they're trying to make up their mind in the last few days. So uh, we're just, I'm so honored to have his support, and, and we're just delighted going into Election Day tomorrow uh, to have President Trump behind us. The differentiator between you and your opponent. Uh, obviously, you support the president's agenda, uh, the, the contract to make America great again. Uh, and the differentiator for the voters of Kansas when they look at you and your opponent. You know, I think there are probably two big issues. One is that I signed the pledge not to raise taxes, and I've been campaigning aggressively on cutting taxes, whereas he's been increasing spending while he's been governor. Uh, the other big issue is illegal immigration, something you and I have been talking about, Lou, for the better part of two decades. Right. Um, as you know, I've been fighting to stop illegal immigration uh, in, in cities and states across the country. Here in Kansas, we've got $424 million worth of public welfare and other benefits going to illegal aliens. We've got sanctuary counties. We give in-state tuition to illegal aliens. And I've been saying, hey, it's time for all of that to stop. And people know I'll do it. And, and my opponent hasn't done anything to stop those uh, problems. You know, it's stunning as, as, as you and I look back over the years. Uh, there was a time, 2006, uh, the, the, the bill was comprehensive immigration reform, as you recall, Senator Ted Kennedy and Senator yeah. John McCain, the proponents and the, and the uh, authors of that legislation. The issues have really not changed dramatically, but the circumstances have become uh, certainly more consequential. Uh, the, the issues uh, and the possible consequences more dire uh, than ever. And yet the establishment churns out propaganda daily that there's no cost to, uh, to free trade, that there is no cost to illegal immigration and, and, and the assault on American middle class jobs and those who aspire to our middle class. If it weren't for this president, my Lord, where would we be as a country? And that's a question I think every American right. uh, going into this fall really needs to ask themselves. What if President Trump hadn't been elected? 
That's exactly right. Look, you know, the establishment uh, reacted negatively when President Trump was running in 2016, as you know. I mean, he was threatening to turn off the supply of illegal labor nationally, and I'm threatening to do that in Kansas. And, and regular Kansans, just like regular Americans all across this country, are saying, you know, we're sick of illegal immigration. We want the rule of law. Uh, we are a country of laws. And I think we're seeing that in this Kansas election as well. Yeah, and, and in Kansas, uh, this president has stood up. I guess President Xi, the European Union, and said, we're going to have balanced trade. There will be no more of this yeah. uh, Koch brothers nonsense. There's no more Chamber of Commerce uh, blather. Uh, we're going to have balanced, reciprocal, fair trade. And no one is going to have to carry this on their backs, as uh, literally millions of Americans have, whether their jobs were being outsourced, whether they were manufacturing jobs, uh, being stripped uh, out of the heartland or whether it's farmers uh, begging for markets instead yeah. of having access to them. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, it, Lou, you think about it, those are two issues that establishment Republicans and Democrats have refused to address for right. many decades. The, the illegal immigration problem and the trade imbalance. And we finally have a president who is addressing both of them. And everybody knows he's absolutely serious about doing it. And I think that's what you're seeing, you know, in, in gubernatorial races like mine, where you have conservatives who echo the president's sentiment on those issues. A lot of people are saying, yeah, I agree with him. Yeah. And uh and tomorrow, uh, that agreement will be expressed in the uh, polling booths of Kansas. Uh, we appreciate you being with us, Chris Kovac. Thanks so much. Always good to talk with you. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Likewise. A pair of wildfires in the northern part of California, now the second largest in that state's history. The Mendocino Complex fires that broke out last month, threatening 9,000 homes. They've burned across 273,000 acres. Imagine that. 273,000 acres and 200 active duty soldiers deployed later this week to help firefighters battle 18 fires across the state. So far, seven people have been killed in the deadly fires that rage, unfortunately, uh, most of them out of control. A reminder to vote in our poll tonight, former Clinton White House Press Secretary Joe Lockhart challenging President Trump and his credibility We'll show you the outrageous comments and much more here next. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. <music> President Trump blasting the national left wing media in a tweet over the weekend. He said this, quote, the fake news hates me saying that they are the enemy of the people only because they know it's true. I am providing a great service by explaining this to the American people. They purposely cause great division and distrust. They can also cause war. They are very dangerous and sick. The talking heads, for example, at CNN, are apoplectic over the president's characterization. Brian Stelter, who has accused Mr. Trump of leading a hate movement against the media, whining about a recent threat made against him. Attacks on the media are having an effect. Threats against reporters are on the rise. But instead of me just telling you that, I want you to hear it for yourself. On Friday, a caller to C-SPAN said he's going to shoot me and Don Lemon if he sees us. Now, let me just preface this by saying I'm not asking for sympathy. Well, of course, Stelter and the national left-wing media remain silent about the violent Antifa movement over the weekend smashing windows of a Marine Corps recruiting office in Berkeley Antifa also part of the violent Portland protest Sunday. And this morning, Antifa targeting conservative journalists Candace Owens and Charlie Kirk as they tried to eat breakfast at a Philadelphia restaurant. The demonstrators chanting white supremacy. Makes perfect sense, right? The prosecution's key witness in the case against the president's former campaign chairman taking the stand today, correspondent Peter Ducey in Alexandria, Virginia, he has the latest on the Manafort trial. Lou, one of the first things the jury heard from Rick Gates today is that he did break the law. One of Mueller's prosecutors asked Rick Gates, were you involved in criminal activity when you worked for Paul Manafort? And Gates said yes. He also testified that he did commit a crime and he did conspire with Paul Manafort when they filed fraudulent tax returns and failed to file a report of foreign bank and financial accounts known as an FBAR. 
The Manafort defense team has long planned to attack Gates' credibility by accusing him of going rogue and embezzling money from his boss, Paul Manafort. But Gates just beat them to it and admitted to stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from his former boss by submitting false expense reports. And even though the jury in this case is constantly told not to do any research on the trial or the main players, Gates disclosed to them that he was arrested and later pled guilty to conspiracy and to lying to federal agents and that he made a deal to cooperate with the government before this appearance. The judge in this case, T.S. Ellis, said days ago that the Mueller team would not be able to prove a conspiracy involving Paul Manafort without hearing from Rick Gates and Manafort's former number two really is not wasting any time sharing what he saw and heard while serving as Manafort's deputy. Gates advanced the Mueller team's theory that huge sums of money would be wired from Manafort-controlled companies, then marked as loans instead of income because there is a tax benefit. Gates told the courtroom when income came in, Mr. Manafort would direct whether it was income or not. And just before court gaveled out for the day with the jury out of the room but the defendant Paul Manafort still sitting there, the judge admonished he really dressed down Mueller's prosecutors because he thinks the trial is taking too long, he wants them to speed it up, and because he does not think essentially that they were using the best manners, and he asked one of the prosecutors to please look at him while he was being addressed. Of course, this is the judge communicating a very harsh message at the end of day five here in Alexandria. Lou? Peter, thank you very much. Peter Ducey, as the Manafort trial goes on, it's getting more interesting, certainly by the day. Up next, the Trump economy booming, job creation off the charts. We'll tell you just how great the economic growth is and likely to be when we return right after these very quick messages. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> 